the Parthians, a prominent ancient Iranian civilization that rose to power in the 3rd century BC, establishing a formidable empire that rivaled Rome in the Near East. Renowned for their skilled cavalry and military tactics, the Parthians expanded their empire across vast territories, encompassing parts of modern-day Iran, Iraq, Armenia, and beyond. Their conflicts and diplomatic relations with Rome, as well as their cultural and economic exchanges along the Silk Road, left a lasting impact on the history of the ancient world, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, it is great to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's good to see you again. If you'd like to support the channel, as always, go and check out my Patreon. Links in the comments and description. Otherwise, if you feel inclined to like, comment, and subscribe, then do so. Now, without further ado, let us begin our full history of the Parthian Empire. Shall we start from the beginning? Let's go there. The Arsacid dynasty, which ruled over the Parthian Empire, traces its origins back to Arsaces I, a chieftain of the Parni tribe, an ancient Central Asian group of Iranian peoples. Before Arsaces rise to power, the region of Parthia was a northeastern province under the Achaemenid and Seleucid empires. The Parni, who most likely spoke an eastern Iranian language, were one of several nomadic tribes within the confederation of the Dahe. The establishment of the Arsacid era in 247 BC marked the beginning of Arsacid's the first's reign. Well, it's a little uncertain of the actual dates. Some scholars do suggest that Arsaces chose this date to coincide with the moment Seleucid control over Parthia came to an end, either through rebellion or conquest. However, others argue that it signifies the year when Arsaces I was appointed chief of the Parni tribe. There are also differing opinions regarding the exact timing of the overthrow of the Seleucid authorities by the Arsacids, with some sources placing it in 247 and others in 248. Now, despite the ambiguity surrounding its inception, the Arsacid dynasty went on to establish a powerful empire in the region adopting Parthian as the official court language, alongside other languages spoken in the multicultural territories that they conquered. Now, the succession following Arsaces I, the founder of the Arsacid dynasty, is a matter of historical debate in itself. Some scholars suggest that Arsaces I was succeeded by his brother Tiradates I, who was then followed by his son Arsaces II. However, once more, and as we will see with much of these uh, pre-common era societies, it's a little tricky to work out. There are discrepancies among historians regarding the timing and order of succession. The reign of Mithridates I, which ended in 138 BC, is considered the first precisely established regnal date in Parthian history. But let's backpedal a little bit before we get on to that. During Arsaces I's reign, he solidified his control over Parthia and Hyrcania, capitalizing on the Third Syrian War between the Seleucid Empire and Ptolemaic Egypt, 
this war lasting between 246 and 41 BC. This conflict had given Arsakes the opportunity to establish his authority, while Diodotus I rebelled and formed the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. Well, despite facing temporary expulsion from Parthia by Seleucid forces, Arzakes I eventually reclaimed his territory, aided by an alliance with Diodotus II. Antiochus III of the great Seleucid Empire, all the way over in the Levant, attempted to retake Parthia and Bactria in 210, but he was unsuccessful in this. So, instead, a peace settlement was negotiated with Arsakes II, who was recognized as a king under the suzerainty of Antiochus III. Now, following this agreement, the Seleucids refrained from further interference in Parthian affairs, focusing instead on challenges from the Roman Republic. This gave the Parthians a little bit of time to build a bit of a home for themselves. Well, Priapatius and Phrates I succeeded Arsakes II, ruling Parthia without significant external intervention from the Seleucids. This period marked the consolidation of Parthian power and the establishment of a lasting dynasty that would shape the region for centuries to come. During the reign of Phrates I, Parthia saw expansion beyond the gates of Alexander, with notable conquests including the Apamea Ragiana, although the exact locations remain uncertain. However, it was under his brother and successor, Mithridates I, that Parthian power reached its zenith, comparable to the achievements of Cyrus the Great of the Achaemenid Empire. Mithridates I embarked on a series of military campaigns that significantly expanded Parthia's territory and influence. Relations with the neighbouring Greco-Bactrian kingdom had begun to deteriorate at this time, and this led to conflict when Mithridates captured territories under the rule of Eucradites I. He then turned his attention back to the Seleucid Empire, invading Media and capturing Ecbatana. Subsequent victories saw the Parthians conquer Babylonia and extend their authority into Mesopotamia and beyond, reaching as far east as the Indus River, that's all the way over near Pakistan and India. So you can see they went quite a long way from home. Now, under the rule of Mithridates, the Parthian capital shifted from Hecatompylos to several strategic cities, including Seleucia, Ecbatana, Tsesiphon, and the newly founded Mithridatkert, or Nisa. These cities served as grand royal residences and centres of administration, with Tsesiphon eventually becoming the official capital during the later reign of Gotarzes I. But what about the Seleucids? Obviously they weren't too impressed with this. Well, you see, the Seleucid Empire, who was weakened by their internal strife, found themselves unable to mount an immediate response to Parthian expansion. Attempts by Demetrius II and Nicator to counter the Parthians in Mesopotamia, that's kind of modern-day Iran between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, ended in defeat. 
and what's more, he was then captured by Mithridates I. But don't worry, Mithridates actually treated him with a great amount of hospitality, and he was so hospitable that he even married his daughter off to him. Can't get better hospitality than that. Well, despite that, hospitality notwithstanding, subsequent Seleucid attempts to reclaim lost territories just kept coming. But the success did not. And all of this culminated in the defeat and death of Antiochus XII Sidetes at the hands of the Parthians at the Battle of Ecbatana in 129. Now pardon me, that was Antiochus the Seventh, not the Twelfth. Well, this decisive victory solidified Parthia's position as a major regional power, and it also marked the decline of the Seleucid Empire. As the Parthians faced challenges from the west, a new threat emerged from the east in the form of nomadic Saka tribes. The displacement of the Yuezhi by the Xiongnu in what is now northwest China prompted the Yuezhi to migrate westward into Bactria, displacing the Saka tribes in their path. Well, forced to move further west, the Saka invaded the northeastern borders of the Parthian Empire, posing a significant challenge to the stability of the region. Mithridates, occupied with his conquests in Mesopotamia, was compelled to retreat to Hyrcania to deal with the Saka incursions. Now, although some Saka were initially enlisted in Phraates' force against Antiochus, tensions rose when Phraates refused to pay their wages. This, of course, rubbed a lot of the Saka the wrong way, and they revolted. They were supported as well by former Seleucid soldiers, which Phraates attempted to suppress, but ultimately failed. Frates II, successor to Frates I, faced the brunt of the Saka rebellion, and was killed in a battle against the combined Saka and former Seleucid forces. Subsequent rulers, such as Artabanus I, also grappled with nomadic incursions from the east with Artabanus meeting a similar fate in a confrontation believed to involve the Tokari, or possibly once again the Yuezhi. Well, it was not until the reign of Mithridates II that the Parthians were able to regain territories lost to the Saka in Sarkastan. Obviously, it was not called that before they showed up. Well, this marked a period of recovery and consolidation for the Parthian Empire amidst eternal threats once Mithridates II got their own back. So, well done to Mithridates II. Now, after the withdrawal of the Seleucids from Mesopotamia, the Parthian Empire under the leadership of Mithridates II, embarked on a series of military campaigns that expanded its influence and territorial control. Himerus, the Parthian governor of Babylonia, was tasked with conquering Charisene, ruled by Hispasiones, uh, from Charax Spasinu. Although initial attempts failed, Hispasiones retaliated by invading Babylonia and occupying Seleucia. However, by 122 BC, Mithridates II successfully ousted Hispasiones from Babylonia and established the kings of Charakin as vassals under Parthian suzerainty. 
Mithridates further extended Parthian control westward, capturing Dura Europros in 113 BC. However, he soon found himself entangled in a conflict with the kingdom of Armenia. His forces defeated and dis disposed Artavastes of Armenia in 97 BC, taking his son Tigranes as a hostage, who would later rise to prominence as Tigranes II of Armenia, also known as Tigranes the Great, and all Armenians know that name. Just ask them. At least, I certainly hope that they know that name. Well, during this period, the Indo-Parthian Kingdom, situated in modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan, formed an alliance with the Parthian Empire. These two states regarded each other as political equals, facilitating diplomatic exchanges and trade relations. The Han Empire of China also engaged with the Parthian Empire through diplomatic means, initiating official trade relations via the Silk Road. Parthia benefited greatly from taxing the lucrative Eurasian caravan trade, importing highly prized goods such as silk and pearls from China, while exporting spices, perfumes, fruits, and even exotic animals to Han China and Rome. The merchants of Sogdia played a crucial role as middlemen in this vibrant trade network, facilitating the exchange of goods between Parthia and China. Now consequently, this period witnessed a flourishing of cultural and economic exchanges between the Parthians and their eastern and western neighbours, and this was good to enrich the empire both materially and culturally. Well, from the mid-first century BC onwards, the Arsacid court of Parthia decided to redirect its focus towards securing its western border, particularly against the Roman Empire, which, of course, around the first century, was gaining a lot of traction, to say the least. The Yuezhi Kushan Empire in northern India also played a significant role in guaranteeing the security of Parthia's eastern frontier during this period. Now, around 92 BC, Parthia engaged in a conflict in Syria against the tribal leader Laodice and her Seleucid ally Antiochus X Eusebius, resulting in the demise of the latter. Subsequently, when the Seleucid monarch Demetrius III Eucarius attempted to besiege modern-day Aleppo, Parthia provided military assistance to the city's inhabitants leading to Demetrius's defeat. While the reign of Mithridates II was succeeded by his son Gotarzes I, whom we've already mentioned, whose rule actually coincided with what scholars term the Parthian Dark Age. This error is categorized by a scarcity of reliable historical records except for a succession of seemingly overlapping regions, and that is indeed what the term Dark Age means. It's simply an age that we have a sort of historical blackout for, or at least a comparatively smaller amount of information compared to the previous or later ages. So when the term Dark Age is heard, there's no real negative connotation. We think of the medieval Dark Ages as dark because they were so terrible and nothing was happening, but that is far from the case. In fact, 
There are many periods of time. One off the top of my head is the Greek Dark Ages. Uh, the period after Bronze Age collapse may be called the Dark Age. So do not automatically assume that this is a negative connotation. It's just we have a scarcity in historical record. So moving out of that Dark Age, the line of Parthian rulers becomes a lot more discernible with the ascension of Orodes II around 57 BC. So this so-called Parthian Dark Age is only really around 30, 35 years. During this period, the split monarchy which they had weakened Parthia's position, enabling Tigranes II, remember the one who was captured before Tigranes the Great, of Armenia to annex Parthian territory in western Mesopotamia. And this loss was not rectified until the reign of Sinatruses. Amidst all of this turmoil, Mithridates the sixth of Pontus sought aid from Parthia against Rome during the Third Mithridatic War. However, Sinatruses declined assistance. Later, when Lucullus marched against the Armenian capital Tigranocerta in 69 BC, both Mithridates the sixth and Tigranes the second sought aid from Phraates the third of Parthia. But you can imagine that their requests were rebuffed. Instead, Phraates the third reaffirmed with Lucullus the Euphrates River as the boundary between Parthia and Rome, thereby avoiding direct involvement in the conflict. Smart move, certainly. While Tigranes the Younger, the son of Tigranes II of Armenia, sought refuge with Phraates III of Parthia after failing to usurp the Armenian throne from his father. Persuading Phraates III to march against Armenia's new capital, Artaxaxa, proved fruitless, unfortunately, leading to Tigranes the Younger to flee once more. This time, to the Roman commander Pompey. While promising to guide Pompey through Armenia, Tigranes the Younger found himself brought to Rome as a hostage when his father submitted to Rome as a client king. Not a very smart young lad, it seems. Well, Phraates the Third demanded his return. But Pompey simply shrugged his shoulders and refused. Phraates did not like this, and it prompted him to retaliate by invading Corduene. Well, this did not last very long, unfortunately for old Phraates, because he met his demise at the hands of his sons, Orodes the Second and Mithridates the Fourth who, beg your pardon, the ninth, who subsequently turned on each other. Orodes the second emerged victorious, driving Mithridates the fourth into exile in Roman Syria. Despite losing Roman support, Mithridates managed to conquer Babylonia, minting coins at Seleucia until his eventual execution by Orodes general Serena and pardon me for correcting myself for the second time, it is indeed Mithridates the fourth. I need another cup of coffee, listeners. Well, in 53 BC, Marcus Licinius Crassus, the proconsul of Syria and one of the triumvirs, invaded Parthia in a somewhat belated attempt to support Mithridates. Orodes II countered by immediately invading Armenia, severing support from Rome's ally, 
Artavastes the second of Armenia. Orodes then orchestrated a marriage alliance between his son Pacorus the first and Artavestes' sister. Surena, leading an army entirely on horseback, that's right, no foot soldiers, cunning strategy, engaged Crassus's forces near Carhe. Now, you probably recognize that name. Despite being outnumbered, Surena's skilled employment of horse archers, along with the infamous Parthian shot tactic, devastated Crassus's infantry, resulting in a significant Roman defeat. Following the devastating defeat at Carhe, where some 20,000 Romans perished, and Crassus himself was killed during a parley, Parthia emerged as a formidable rival to Rome, and they were certainly being taken very seriously now. Surena, the Parthian general responsible for the victory, returned triumphantly to Seleucia. However, his growing influence aroused suspicions in Orodes II, leading to his execution shortly after. Well, the Parthians, emboldened by their success, launched further incursions into Roman territories. Crown Prince Pacorus I raided Syria, penetrating as far as Antioch, but was repelled by Gaius Cassius Longinus. In subsequent years, Parthia aligned with Pompey against Julius Caesar and supported the anti-Caesarian forces at the Battle of Philippi. In 40 BC, Quintus Labienus, a general allied with Cassius and Brutus, joined forces with Parthia against the Second Triumvirate. Pacorus then invaded Syria, while Labienus advanced into Anatolia. The Roman Levant fell completely under Parthian control, with settlements along the Mediterranean coast subdued. And in Judea, the pro-Roman forces were also defeated, and Antigonus II Mattathias was installed as the new king. However, the fortunes of the Romans had to change, and they soon did. Publius Ventidius Bassus, under Mark Antony's command, defeated Labienus at the Battle of the Cilician Gates and Pharnapates at the Battle of the Aminus Pass. Pacorus met his end at the Battle of Mount Gindarus, prompting a succession crisis in Parthia with Frates the Fourth ultimately ascending to the throne. Upon ascending to the Parthian throne, this new ruler, Frates the Fourth, swiftly dealt with potential threats by killing his own brothers. You can't choose your family. One of them, Monoeses, sought refuge with Antony, and actually persuaded him to launch an invasion of Parthia, narrowly avoiding his death. While Antony's campaign saw success in 37 BC, when he defeated Parthia's ally Antigonus in Judea, installing Herod as a client king. In 36 BC, Antony marched towards Theodosiopolis, long name, right, receiving troops from Artavastes II of Armenia. However, Artavastes II later abandoned Antony's forces when Phrates IV ambushed them in Media Atropatene, hindering Antony's advance towards Praspa, the Parthian capital. Harassed by Parthian forces, Antony's army fled to Armenia, sustaining significant losses. 
Well, old Antony, resorting to trickery, captured Artavastes II in 34 BC, and they subjected him to a mock Roman triumph in Alexandria, before his eventual execution by Cleopatra. And, by the way, Antony and Cleopatra were, let's just say, very involved with each other at this point. Antony's attempts to form alliances with Artavastes I of Maduria Atropatene were futile, and he withdrew from Armenia in 33 to face challenges from Octavian in the west. Following Antony's defeat and death in 30 BC, Parthia's ally, Artaxius II, reclaimed the Armenian throne, solidifying Parthian influence in the region. Now, after the defeat and demise of Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, Octavian rose to power in Rome and was proclaimed Augustus by the Senate in 27 BC, marking the beginning of the Roman Empire. Of course, before then it was the Roman Republic. Now, around this period, Tiridates II of Parthia briefly ousted Phraates IV from the throne, only to be reinstated swiftly with the aid of Scythian nomads. Tiridates sought refuge with the Romans, and he took one of Phraates' sons with him. In 20 BC, negotiations between Phraates IV and Augustus resulted in the return of the kidnapped prince to Parthia, in exchange for the lost legionary standards that were taken at Carhe in 53 BC, along with any surviving prisoners of war, of course. Now this exchange, while seen as a victory for Augustus, was viewed by the Parthians as a relatively minor concession to retrieve their prince. I mean, the legionary standards were effectively gathering dust in the basement, if we may use those terms, and the surviving prisoners of war, ones that had survived, well, I suppose they were probably a little bit sick of taking care of them anyway. As part of the arrangement, Frates was a little bit cheeky, because he demanded an Italian slave girl. This Italian slave girl later became Queen Musa of Parthia, by the way. Well, to secure the succession for her son Fratakes, Musa persuaded Frates IV to send his other sons to Rome as hostages. Augustus utilized this event for political propaganda portraying it as a significant triumph over Parthia, and listing it among his achievements in various mediums. When Fratakes ascended to the throne as Frates V, Musa wielded considerable influence alongside him, even marrying him, according to Josephus, contemporary historian. However, their rule faced opposition from the Parthian nobility due to concerns over non-Arsacid blood in the royal lineage. Eventually, Frates and Musa were forced into exile in Roman territory. Succession troubles continued in Parthia with the brief reign of Orodes III, followed by Vonones I whose pro-Roman tendencies angered the Parthian nobility. Therefore, Artabanes II emerged as a rival claimant, ultimately defeating Vanones and driving him into exile in Roman Syria. During the reign of Artabanes II, two Jewish brothers, Anilai and Asinai, 
staged a revolt against the Parthian governor of Babylonia. Upon their victory, Artabanus II granted them governance over the region to prevent further uprisings. However, internal conflicts arose within the Jewish regime, leading to the demise of Asinai and the eventual defeat of Anali by a son-in-law of Artabanus. With the Jewish rule dismantled, native Babylonians began to harass the local Jewish community, prompting them to leave and seek refuge in Seleucia. However, when Seleucia rebelled against Parthian rule, the Jews were once again expelled, this time by the local Greeks and Arameans. Forced into exile again, the Jewish community scattered to Tsesiphon, Nerhardea, and Nisibis. Meanwhile, despite a state of peace, Rome continued to meddle in Parthian affairs. Emperor Tiberius became embroiled in a plot by Pharasmanes I of Iberia to install his brother Mithridates as the ruler of Armenia by assassinating the Parthian ally King Arsaces. Artabanes II's failed attempt to regain control of Armenia triggered a revolt among the aristocracy, forcing him to flee to Scythia. The Romans, in turn, released Tiridates III of Parthia as a hostage to rule Armenia as a Roman ally. However, Artabanes managed to depose Tiridates shortly before his death. Following Artabanus's demise, a civil war erupted between his rightful successor Vardanes I and his brother Gotarzes II. The assassination of Vardanes during a hunting expedition led to the Parthian nobility to seek Roman assistance resulting in the release of Meherdates to challenge Gotarzes. However, Meherdates' capture and subsequent brutal mutilation by Gotarzes thwarted this attempt at usurpation. Now, something a little bit less violent, a little different for you. The expedition of Gan Ying, sent by the Chinese general Ban Chao in 97 AD, aimed to establish diplomatic relations with the Roman Empire. Lofty goals. Gan Ying travelled westward, reaching the court of Pacorus II in Hectampilos, before continuing towards Rome. However, upon reaching the Persian Gulf, Persian authorities convinced him that the only way to reach Rome was through a perilous sea voyage around the Arabian Peninsula. Well, he was naturally discouraged by this, and Gan Ying returned to the Han court and provided Emperor He of Han with a detailed report on the Roman Empire based on the accounts of his Parthian hosts. Now it is speculated that the Parthians may have been relieved by the failed diplomatic efforts between the Han Empire and Rome, particularly considering Ban Chao's military successes against the Xiongnu in Eastern Central Asia. However, Chinese records suggest that a Roman embassy, or perhaps a group of Roman merchants, reached the Han capital of Luoyang around 166 AD during the reign of Marcus Aurelius of Rome and Emperor Huan of Han. This event is noteworthy, as it is potentially indicating some level of direct contact, or at least trade between Rome and Han China, not just going through middlemen in Parthia and along the Silk Road. Additionally, archaeological findings 
such as Antonine Roman golden medallions dated to the reigns of Marcus Aurelius and Antoninus Pius, have been discovered at Oc Eo in Vietnam, part of the Mekong Delta region. Oc Eo is one of the suggested locations for the port city of Katigara, mentioned in Ptolemy's geography, situated along the Magnus Sinus, which encompasses the Gulf of Thailand and the South China Sea. While these discoveries hint at the possibility of maritime trade routes linking the Roman Empire and Southeast Asia during the Antonine period. The period following Vologases, the first withdrawal of forces from Armenia, saw Rome attempting to fill the political vacuum left behind, leading to the Roman Parthian War of 58 to 63 AD. During this conflict, the Roman commander Gnaeus Domitius Corbulo achieves some military successes against the Parthians, while installing Tigranes VI of Armenia as a Roman client. However, Corbulo's successor, Lucius Cassenius Paetus, suffered a significant defeat at the hands of Parthian forces, and fled from Armenia. After the subsequent peace treaty, Tiridates journeyed to Naples in Rome in 63 AD, where the Roman Emperor Nero ceremoniously crowned him King of Armenia by placing the royal diadem on his head. This event marked the beginning of a long period of peace between Parthia and Rome, with only minor conflicts mentioned by Roman historians, such as the invasion of Alans into Parthian territories around 72 AD. Well, this peace notwithstanding, later Roman empires showed more aggression towards Parthia, attempting to conquer the eastern area of the Fertile Crescent. Now this shift in policy can be attributed in part to Rome's military reforms, which aimed to match Parthia's strength in missile troops and mounted warriors. The Romans utilized foreign allies also, particularly the Nabataeans, and established a permanent auxiliar force to complement their heavy legionary infantry. They even maintained regiments of horse archers, I wonder where they got that idea from, and male armoured cataphracts in their eastern provinces. However, despite all these efforts, Rome gained very little territory from these invasions, with the primary motivations for war being mainly the personal glory and political position of the emperor. And don't think that's a strange thing. That happens all the time. Just ask Julius Caesar about how he paid his debt off. Well, it wasn't just that. It was as well the defense of Roman honor against perceived Parthian interference in the affairs of Rome's client states. And also because Rome wanted to be the, the biggest kid on the playground. Let's put it that way. The renewal of hostilities between Rome and Parthia occurred when Osroes I of Parthia deposed the Armenian king Sanatruk and replaced him with Axidares, son of Pacorus II, without consulting Rome. In response to this, the Roman Emperor Trajan had the next Parthian nominee for the throne, Parthamasiris, killed in 114 AD, marking Armenia a Roman province. Now Trajan's forces, led by Lucius Quietus, also captured Nisbis, an essential location for securing major trade routes across the northern Mesopotamian plain. 
In 115 AD, Trajan invaded Mesopotamia. Facing little resistance, except from Meharaspes of Adiabene, as Osroes was engaged in a civil war with Vologasis III of Parthia to the east. Trajan then spent the winter of 115 to 16 at Antioch, before resuming his campaign the following spring. And once he did, he captured several key cities, including Dura Europos, Tesiphon, Seleucia, and even Charisene, from where he observed ships departing for India from the Persian Gulf. Well, at the end of 116 AD, Trajan had also captured Susa. Sanatruces II of Parthia gathered forces in eastern Parthia to challenge the Romans. But his cousin, Parthamaspates of Parthia, betrayed and killed him, prompting Trajan to crown him as the new king of Parthia. However, Trajan faced a few more difficulties in maining, maintaining control rather, over the captured territories, with Babylonian settlements revolting against the Roman garrisons. Trajan planned to renew his attack on Parthia in 118, but he died suddenly in the August of 117. Well, despite being granted the title of Patricus by the Senate, and minting coins proclaiming the conquest of Parthia, Trajan's attempts to establish a Roman province in Lower Mesopotamia remains disputed, with only later sources alleging such an endeavour. So maybe he had that on the list, but whether or not this was a genuine goal of his... I suppose we'll never know. Now Hadrian, Trajan's successor, opted to reaffirm the Roman Parthian border at the Euphrates, refraining from further invasions of Mesopotamia due to Rome's limited military resources. Parthamas Partes, after being overthrown by the Parthians, was made king of Osroin by the Romans. Following Osroes I's death during his conflict with Vologases III, Vologases IV ascended to the Parthian throne. And he actually wasn't bad. He ushered in a period of relative peace and stability, giving people a much-needed respite from the chaos of the previous times. Well, of course, all good things must come to an end. The Roman Parthian War of 161 to 166 AD erupted when Vologases invaded Armenia and Syria, retaking the city of Edessa. Marcus Aurelius and his co ruler, Lucius Verus, responded by sending forces to guard Syria and invade Armenia and Mesopotamia respectively. Although the Romans achieved initial success, capturing Seleucia and Ctesiphon, they were forced to retreat due to a deadly disease that ravaged their ranks. Bad luck, don't you think? Septimius Severus, however, renewed hostilities with Parthia in 197 during the reign of Vologases V. The Romans once again made their march down the Euphrates, capturing Seleucia and Ctesiphon. However, Severus had failed to capture Hatra during a siege, and retreated after assuming the title Pathicus Maximus. Around 212 AD, Artabanus IV rebelled against his brother Vologases VI, gaining control over a significant portion of the Parthian Empire. Meanwhile, 
Caracalla, the Roman Emperor, deposed the kings of Osirene and Armenia, turning them back into Roman provinces. Caracalla marched into Mesopotamia, intending to marry one of Artabanus' daughters, but the marriage was refused. This led to war with Parthia, during which Caracalla conquered Arbil and sacked the Parthian tombs. However, Caracalla was assassinated the following year, and at the Battle of Nisibis, the Parthians managed to defeat the Romans. Now both sides suffered heavy losses, leading to a settlement where the Romans paid Parthia a substantial sum, along with additional gifts. The transition from the Parthian Empire to the Sasanian Empire marked a significant shift in the dynamics of power in the Middle East. Ardashir I, a local Iranian ruler from Persis, embarked on a campaign to challenge Arsacid rule and unify the Iranian territories under his authority. This culminated in the Battle of Hormozgan on April 28, 224 AD, where Ardashir I defeated Artabanus IV, establishing the Sasanian Empire in its place. Although there are indications that Vologases VI continued to mint coins at Seleucia until about 228, the defeat of Artabanus IV marked the end of Parthian dominance. The Sasanians inherited Parthia's role as Rome's principal adversary in the region, and they sought to reclaim the boundaries of the Achaemenid Empire, which included territories such as the Levant, Anatolia, and even as far as Egypt. Under Khosrau II, the Sasanians briefly succeeded in capturing these territories from the Eastern Roman Empire. However, their hold over these regions proved to be temporary, as they were eventually reclaimed by Heraclius, the last Roman emperor before the Arab conquests. Well, despite losing these territories, the Sasanians remained Rome's primary rival for more than four centuries. And if you want to learn about them, well, you'll just have to wait for the video on the Sasanians, won't you? Oh, don't worry. It's coming up very soon. Possibly in a day's time. We shall see. But for now, we will end the video here. That will allow you to relax and meditate on your learned. I'd like to thank my Mega Chad patron, Stark Factory, for his contribution to the channel. If you would like to make your contribution, then head over to the Patreon. Links are in the comments and description. Otherwise, thank you once again for watching. It's been a pleasure. And I will see you in the next video. Good night, everyone.